Well, good evening, friends. Tonight we have a goal that we want to work on together, and that is that we want to come away from this evening, from this session, convinced that if we are to understand God's plan of salvation, then it is essential that we understand the Old Testament of the Bible. So we want to start with a quick story to get us thinking. It's about a boy, a young, a boy born to a poor family, in very humble circumstances. And he spent his early years in exile. He had to flee from his native home because his family feared that if he was to stay where he belonged, they would lose him. All his peers were taken by the hands of an awful, wicked government. He, however, survived in exile and he returned in time to his home, to a town now void of his peers. Well, this young boy grew up to learn a trade so that he might be able to survive, earn his survival. And even then, he didn't even own a pillow. He only lived 33 years, and he died by means of capital punishment. This man was Jesus Christ, the beloved son of God. Yet, but despite his unpretentious beginnings, this man would have to be the most famous individual in the history of the world. You just think about it. Half the world's population consider him the saviour of the world, or at least a great prophet. Our dating system is based on the life and time of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have BC, before Christ, and AD, Anno Domini, which is Latin for in the year of our Lord. The cross has become a symbol of death, and to many Christians it's a symbol of hope and ultimate love. You see, Christ is, is a very famous individual. In fact, throughout the years since his life, many thousands of martyrs have died for him. People who have never met him loved him so much that they were prepared to die for him. Yet for all this fame, his own people rejected him. His own people rejected him, whom he had come to save. How could that be? How could a nation reject such an incredible man? Well, the Jews at the time of Christ's birth were actually waiting for a saviour. Throughout the full duration of the mortal life of Jesus Christ, the land of Israel was occupied by the Romans. And the Jews wanted a messiah to save them from the Roman oppression. Well, the Old Testament prophesied that a Messiah would come. But the issue was that the majority of the Jews didn't understand who the Messiah would be. They didn't understand their Bibles. They didn't understand what the Messiah would be like. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 8, we're told about, in verse 7, we're told about the wisdom of God in his plan of salvation. And then referencing that wisdom, verse 8 says that none of the princes of the world knew that wisdom, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Now, we don't want to fall to the same demise. Hopefully, we're familiar enough with our Bibles to know that the Bible is made up of 66 books, 
and they're divided into two main sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. We've got 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New. Well, ladies and gentlemen, these, these two testaments are intrinsically linked, and we're going to see that tonight as we work through our session. Now, the Old Testament begins with Genesis, and in Genesis the first thing that the book records is God creating everything on this earth, including the first man and woman. And then in the third chapter, very early in the book, we read of the first sin against God. Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and so they were condemned to mortality because God will not reward sin. And because we all descend from Adam and Eve, we all inherited that sin-prone disposition. And due to our own sins, we likewise earn death. But was God going to leave it there? Well, God himself says no. He says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. In Ezekiel 33 verse 11, he says... He says to Ezekiel, say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their way to live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. And you can see what God wants here. He wants people to turn away from sin so that he can reward them with life. God wants to save people, but not in a sinful state. And so he develops a plan. And that plan was a saviour for mankind. And our subject tonight is to find that saviour, that plan of a saviour, in the Old Testament. Now this saviour is of course the Lord Jesus Christ. But as you would know, Jesus Christ is a New Testament character. So to begin with, we're going to turn to the Gospel of Luke and to the 24th chapter of that Gospel. Luke is the third of the Gospel writers and in the last chapter of his Gospel, chapter 24, he records the resurrection to life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Luke 24... The Lord Jesus Christ is going to tell his disciples that they should have expected his death and resurrection because it was prophesied in the Old Testament. Well, this is one of the most exciting chapters of Scripture, really. The resurrection to life of the Saviour of the world. And in your own time, it would be a great chapter to read. But we're just going to pick out some key passages Uh, from this chapter to illustrate a point and that point is how essential the Old Testament scriptures were in or are in detailing the plan of God's salvation. Well first of all let's identify exactly what the Jews were looking for in this Messiah. Verse 13 of Luke 24. There, two of Jesus' disciples are setting out on foot for the village called Emmaus. It's about two, a two- or three-hour walk from Jerusalem. And Jesus approaches them and asks, Why are you sad? And they don't recognise him. Now, Jesus has just been resurrected from the dead. He's been crucified, he's been dead for three days, and he's risen again. And he comes up to these two disciples. Why are you sad? And they say, oh, verse 11 says, they didn't, they didn't believe that Jesus had been risen from the dead. And so they, they ask him, don't you know what's been happening around Jerusalem? And he says, what things? And the two disciples just break down and tell him of all their unraveled hopes and dreams. Verse 19. He says unto them, What things? And they, un- they s- said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, 
which was a prophet mighty in deed and in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. So they thought that Jesus would deliver Israel. But now that he was dead, that hope had dissolved. But what were these two disciples doing, walking off from Jerusalem, when they had been told that Jesus would rise again the third day? Just turn back to verse 5. Here, Two angels are speaking to the women who came to visit the tomb of the Lord Jesus Christ on the third day. And the angels say to the women, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, but he's risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was in Galilee, saying, verse 7, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. So Christ had already told them in Galilee that he was going to die and he would be crucified and he would rise again the third day. But the disciples had a very different understanding of how the Saviour would come. They should have expected his death. And his resurrection because he had said so. Well, now at this point, it would be good for you all to get involved in a little activity. And we're about to put up on the screen a key word that pops up four times in this chapter. So if you have your own Bible with you and you've got a pencil, it'd be an excellent idea to colour or circle in the key words of this passage so that when you come back to this passage it makes sense to you uh, when you return later. Now the reason you might want to colour this is because this word in the New Testament uh, is translated from the Greek text and the same Greek word is translated in three different English words in the Bible that I use, the King James Version which, of course, as you could understand, makes it quite difficult uh, to understand the emphasis of the passage. So the Greek word is dai, D-E-I, and it comes up in four places in this chapter. Verse 7, it's translated must. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men. Then in verse 26, it's translated ought, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? In verse 44, it's translated must. These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. And last of all, verse 46, it's the word behoved. Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Now, why is all this relevant? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ is telling his disciples in this chapter that they should have known what was going to happen. The Greek word die means of necessity. It's binding. It must happen. In today's terms, we might say it's set in concrete. And what Christ is saying here is that it is absolutely essential that he died and rose again the third day. Why? Because verse 25, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken, the prophets had prophesied it. And because of that, Christ must have suffered those things. And entered into his glory. There's our word for necessitated. 
it was necessary that that happened. And verse 27, Jesus then, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, expounded unto them, that's those two disciples walking to Emmaus, he expounded unto them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. You should have known, he says. It was prophesied in the law of Moses and in the prophets. We'll now come to verse 44, because here Jesus speaking to the 11 apostles now, the 11 disciples, is going to add another part of scripture that prophesies of him. He says there in verse 44, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in, one, the law of Moses, two, the prophets, and three, in the Psalms concerning me. And he says, verse 46, Thus it is written, and thus it absolutely necessitated that Christ should should suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. And what was the purpose of all this happening? Verse 47, that repentance and remission or wiping away of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a story of hope. It's a hope for all nations, and you and I can all be part of it. Well, let's have a look at the Old Testament and see what the Old Testament has to say about this hope in the man Jesus Christ. And we want to do so by looking at these three parts of Scripture, parts of the Old Testament, that Christ has identified for us. So we're going to take a look at the uh, books of Moses, known as the, the Law or the Pentateuch. We'll then have a look at the Psalms and then finally at the Prophets. And from each of these sections, we want to pull out one key feature of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, to start off, we're going to go to the Law of Moses. And we're going to go to Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy is the fifth of the books of Moses. In Deuteronomy 18... God is answering the problem that the nation of Israel are frightened of the incredible voice of God. And so God says, I understand that. And so verse 15 of Deuteronomy 18, God says, I will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him shall ye hearken. So God is saying, I'm going to provide you with someone who is like me. Someone with a very good character. But he's going to be from among you. He's going to be of your brethren. He's going to be a human being. And he will teach you and you will listen to him. And God adds verse 18, I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that I command thee. Command him, sorry. So he will. This is a future work that God is going to do. And God says, if you don't listen, verse 19, at the end of the verse, God says, I will require it. Okay, so who's this speaking about? Well, let's turn back to the New Testament, to the book of the Acts of the Apostles. Because in Acts 3, the Apostle Peter is going to directly quote Deuteronomy 18 in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ in the capacity of a teacher and a prophet. Now, Acts is straight after the four gospel records, so it's pretty easy to find. And if you want to turn to chapter 3. In this chapter, the Apostle Peter is exhorting the people to understand who Jesus was. And in verse 22, Peter quotes Deuteronomy. 
verse 22. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. Now, why is this all relevant to to us in the 21st century, you might ask? Fair enough. Well, Peter continues to quote Deuteronomy. And he adds a little more emphasis. It shall come to pass that every soul, every soul that will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. This is certainly worth our urgent consideration. And so Israel expected a saviour. But when he came, they didn't like his message. They expected a Messiah who would, who would uh, deliver them from the Romans, who would sit on the throne of David, King David. Now, who is this David? Well, he's the ancient king of Israel, who we looked at a couple of Sundays ago when we looked at the promises made to David. Just have a look at Acts chapter 2. Just back a chapter. Verse 29. Here Peter is making a speech again, and he says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, And his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that's the promises to David, that of the fruit of his loins, one of his descendants, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, Neither his flesh did see corruption. So David knew that Christ would sit on his throne. But he also knew that Christ would first die and that he would be resurrected. He was resurrected the third day. He wasn't left to rot. His flesh did not see corruption. Well, let's now turn to the Psalms. We've had a look at the law of Moses. Let's have a look at the Psalms. We've just seen that David was a prophet that God spoke to. We want to turn to Psalm 22. Now, at the very beginning of Psalm 22, you'll notice in the superscription, right at the top of the chapter, it says that it's a psalm of David. And in this chapter, sorry, in this psalm, David is going to make some prophecies concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, again, we're going to run through a little exercise, if you would like to. You'll need a pen or a pencil. And what you want to do is put four cross-references in your margin in Psalm 22 that will reference the Gospel of Matthew and the 27th chapter of that gospel, which is the fulfilment of this psalm. So this psalm is about the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the reason you might want to put this in your margin is because when you come back to this psalm, when you read it later, you will know straight away that this psalm is prophesying the crucifixion of Christ, which is fulfilled in Matthew chapter 27. Now... You may see in pink here, some Bibles have some of these cross-references already in them. So you you may be able to just see a reference in your margin that is already there, and you may be able to circle that to draw your attention to it. Now, all the Gospel records do make reference to this psalm, but to simplify things, we're simply going to look at a comparison with Matthew's Gospel and chapter 27. So, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now if we go to the New Testament, to 
the Gospel of Matthew. You can stay in Psalm 22. We'll put the quotes up on the screen. We'll find in Matthew 27 that these are some of the last words of the Lord Jesus Christ while he hung on the cross. In verse 46 of Matthew 27, Jesus says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Okay, interesting. So Christ quotes this psalm at his crucifixion. Why? Because he saw it as relevant to himself. He knew that he was prophesied in this psalm. Why? Let's have a look. Verse 7 of the psalm. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake their heads saying, He trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him if he delight in him. Well, in Matthew 27, verse 39 to 43... The Jews do exactly that to Christ. They wagged their heads at him and said, If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. And so exactly the same terms are used of the people's treatment of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, now over the page to verse 16 of the psalm at the end of the verse there we read they pierced my hands and my feet now this one is incredibly interesting why would David say they pierced my hands and my feet we know of course with hindsight that Christ died by crucifixion but the method of crucifixion hadn't been invented yet when David wrote this psalm. Crucifixion wasn't invented until the Persians some oh, around 600 BC, some 600 years before David lived. And then following the, in the following four centuries until Christ, the, the Romans developed, further developed the, um, I guess, art of crucifixion. So clearly, clearly here we have in verse 16 a very obvious prophecy of, that you can link to Matthew 27, verse 35, which says that they crucified him. And then the last comparison that we want to make is in verse 18. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Now this very odd transaction took place in Matthew 27, verse 35 also, which says, They parted his garments, casting lots. Speaking of the Roman soldiers there. That it might be fulfilled, Matthew continues, which was spoken by the prophet, they parted my garments among them, and for my vesture they cast lots. Directly quoting Psalm 22. So there... In Matthew's Gospel, he makes it abundantly clear that this is the fulfilment of the words of the prophet. And who was the prophet? Well, Peter told us that David was a prophet. And here we've just read, this is a psalm of David. And so the Lord Jesus Christ sees one thing after another being fulfilled in, in these psalms. This isn't the only psalm that, that has prophecies of Christ. Many, many, many of them do. And the Lord sees each of these being fulfilled and he says at the end some of his last words. He blurts out the opening line of the psalm. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He knew that he was the fulfilment of this psalm. Okay, so what have we seen so far? <coughs> Excuse me. We've seen Christ prophesied of in the writings of Moses and we've also seen him prophesied in the Psalms. <coughs> that leaves us one more section to deal with and that is the prophets. So please turn over to Daniel chapter 7. 
Daniel follows the, the book of Daniel follows the three big prophecies of Isaiah, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. So we've seen that Jesus would come as a teacher and that he would die. But the question we asked at the beginning is why did the Jews reject Jesus? Well, they expected him to come as a king rather than a teacher that would die. They wanted a saviour who would deliver them from the Romans. Well, hopefully you've all found Daniel 7. And in verse 13 and 14, we see a prophecy about Jesus becoming king. Verse 13, I, Daniel, saw in the visions, the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. All right, let's just stop there for a moment. You may remember at the beginning when we were looking at Acts that we saw there, uh, sorry, in Luke 24, sorry, we saw there that Christ is called the Son of Man, where he says, the Son of Man must be crucified and the third day rise again. So the Son of Man here is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Ancient of Days here is speaking of God. And that's, that's a title of God that you can establish if you take a bit of a deeper look into the context. So what's the verse saying? We have Jesus Christ coming with the clouds of heaven brought near to God. And verse 14, And there was given to Christ dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. So here, God gives Jesus a kingdom and dominion over all people, over all different nations and languages, and it's going to be an everlasting kingdom. That was the Messiah that the Jews hoped for. The problem was they didn't understand God's plan to save people without sin. They wanted salvation on their terms. They wanted freedom from the Roman oppression and they wanted it now. They thought they should be saved as they were. And so in total denial of their saviour that God had sent, they put him to death. But that kingdom is still going to come. And Jesus Christ will reign over all nations. That includes Australia. It includes the USA, Russia, China. Christ will rule over the whole world. And that kingdom will last forever. Just come over now to Luke chapter 1. In Luke 1, Mary is promised the saviour of the world, whose name, of course, would be Jesus. And in verse 32 of Luke chapter 1, we read that Jesus would be great and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And so here in the New Testament also, we're told in no uncertain terms that Christ will be king over an everlasting kingdom. And at the other end of the Gospels, the disciples understood that that kingdom was yet to come. Let's turn over now to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, here Jesus is spending his very last day with the disciples following his resurrection. And they hoped that now, now that Jesus had died and had been risen again, 
They hoped that now he would set up that prophesied kingdom. And so they ask him in verse 6 of Acts 1, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They wanted him to sit on David's throne now. And the Lord responds to them. It's not for you to know the, to know the time. What's important for you, you, you won't know when, when this is going to happen. You won't know the times or the seasons. But what is important for you is verse 8. You're going to be witnesses of me in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. You're going to be witnesses throughout the world. And that's the last thing he says. Because in verse 9, he's taken up into heaven, out of their sight, and it says a cloud received him. And in verse 10 and 11, the, the disciples are there staring up at this cloud. And two angels say to them, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? For this same Jesus, which was taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is coming back. He's gone to receive his kingdom from God, as Daniel the prophet described. And he's coming back to be king over all nations. But whilst Christ is with his father, he's left us a legacy to follow. The last thing he said to his disciples is that we need to be witnesses for him. The Greek word translated witnesses here is the word martyrs, from which we get our English word martyr. Martyr actually means to be a witness, to, to stand by what we know, even at the peril of our own lives. We'll come over to Luke chapter 9, verse 23. I'll actually put it up on the screen there. What does this mean, to be a martyr? Well, in Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, the Lord Jesus Christ has some very strong concepts for us to consider. He says to his disciples in verse 23, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, what Christ is referencing here is his walk to his crucifixion, where he was forced to carry the stake on which he would be crucified. But he's clearly speaking metaphorically here. We're told to take up our cross daily. You know, we can't literally walk to our death every day because the next day it wouldn't happen. Well, five chapters later, in Luke 14, verse 27... Again, the Lord Jesus Christ speaking, he says there, Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me is not worthy of me. Right, so this is absolutely essential for us to get our heads around what he's talking about here. Well, the fifth chapter of Paul's letter to the Galatians will be helpful in uh, picking apart what, what Christ is saying here. So come over to Galatians chapter 5. It's about six books on from the Gospel of Luke. In Galatians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul writes in verse 24, they that are Christ, they that belong to Christ, have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. 
Now, what does it mean to crucify the flesh? Well, Paul explains it a few verses earlier in verse 19, where he tells us what it is that we need to crucify, what we need to put to death or remove from our lives. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh, which are manifest, are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and things like that. Of the which, Paul says, I tell you before, as I've already told you in time past, that those which do such things will not be in the kingdom of God. So Paul is telling us that we need to remove those terrible Terrible things from our lives. Crucify them. And that is why Jesus Christ tells us in Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, we need to take up our cross daily. This is going to be a daily exercise to to avoid these characteristics. Because if we do them, we will not be in the kingdom of God. And that is the kingdom of God. That Christ is going to rule over. And so instead, in verse 22 and 23 of Galatians 5, Paul tells us that we should instead practice love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. These are the beautiful characteristics that the Lord Jesus Christ Himself showed. Now, Remember at the beginning, we said that the Jews rejected the Messiah because they wanted a king who would deliver them from the Romans. They didn't expect him to come as a teacher who demanded them to change their lives. And remember that God had a plan that would save people, but he won't save people in a sinful state. And so he sent his son Jesus as a teacher who was then killed by his own people in fulfilment of Old Testament prophecies. But he's coming back as king. Let's have a look at this passage from the letter to the Hebrews in chapter 9 and verse 28. There it says that so Christ was once offered, he once died, to bear the sins of many, Because God cannot look on sin. And unto them that look for Christ shall he appear the second time. He's coming back without sin. And he's coming back for salvation. Christ will bring salvation to those who are looking for him. And the Jews of Christ's day didn't want to make the life changes that were required, and so they rejected him. But he's coming back, and the question for you and I is, are we going to accept him, or are we going to reject him? Are we prepared to make the life changes that he demands of us? Let's finish up in the last book of the Bible, in Revelation. The mortal life of the Lord Jesus Christ is prophesied of in fine detail in the Old Testament scriptures. But his second coming is prophesied of both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so we want to close by just having a look at that. In Revelation chapter 3. In Revelation chapter 3, Christ promises an incredible hope for those who are prepared to put in the effort to take up their cross daily and follow him. Those who are prepared to make the commitment. And he says in Revelation 3 verse 21, to him that overcometh, that overcomes all those 
evil characteristics that we looked at in Galatians a moment ago. If you overcome them, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. So Christ is currently with God in the heavens. As Daniel said, he's gone to receive his kingdom and he's coming back. And as, as the angels said in Acts 1, he's coming back. And if we overcome sin's draw, then Christ will grant us to be glorified with him, to reign over the earth with him. Just look at uh, Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. Here it's speaking of the believers who have been given immortality because they were faithful. And these believers, now called saints, sing a new song saying uh, in verse 9 and 10, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. So here's all different nationalities being redeemed by God, forgiven for their sins, and saved. And verse 10, And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. You see, Christ is coming back to reign on earth. And if we want to be a part of it, we can reign with him. One more passage in closing. Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22 is the last chapter of the Bible. And it's also the last words of the Lord Jesus Christ for those who are prepared to read their Bibles. And so, of course, it's a very important message that he has. Revelation 22 and verse 11 and 12. Jesus is going to return and he says that when he does, verse 11, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold... I come quickly or suddenly and my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. When Christ returns, ladies and gentlemen, he will judge us in the state in which he finds us. He's coming back to the earth as king, as king over the whole earth. And the question for you and I is, will you be ready for him?